when we discover that the genes you're born with are associated with whether or not you graduate from college, and then we think about what do college graduates get more of compared to non-college graduates in this country right now? What does that nudge us to in terms of um, new intuitions about whether it's fair or unfair? I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Last year, we had two episodes on the pluses and minus of meritocracy. And of course, supporters of meritocracy, such as Adrian Woldridge, emphasize its ethical dimension. That is a system that rewards effort. Critics, such as Sandel, emphasize the lack component. At the end of the day, it's uh, an empirical question. How much success is driven by effort and how much is driven by luck? This is an extremely difficult distinction to make empirically. Yet, we all agree that we don't deserve our genes. For this reason, it's important to understand what component of success is genetically determined. We decided to this purpose to invite an expert on this topic, Catherine Page Harden, author of the book, The Genetic Lottery. to start just by asking you to explain both the nuanced position that you're trying to carve out on this issue and why it is that on this issue it is so difficult to achieve nuance, at least in the minds of the people who are reading your book. So the way these studies work, we can collect genetic information on many, many people. So um, to give you an example, a study that we did this year pooled genetic data from one and a half million people. And each person is measured on what are called SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms. What we're interested in are single DNA letters that differ between people. So I might have a G in a certain spot and you might have a T in a certain spot. And these differences between us are scattered throughout the whole genome. Um, So we're measuring hundreds of thousands or even millions of these DNA letter differences between people. And then we're correlating each one of those genetic variants, variants meaning differences between people, with something we've measured about people. So in the case of height, this would be, are certain genes more common amongst taller people? In the case of obesity, it would be, are certain genes more common amongst heavier people? In the case of educational attainment, is are certain genes, and and actually to be more precise, are certain SNPs more common amongst people who've gone further in school, have completed more years of formal schooling? So what you, once you've done that study, Um, What you typically find is one, the correlations that you've estimated are incredibly small. So any one genetic variant does not make that much of a difference. We're not talking about a a gene for anything. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of genes that are all tiny, 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 tiny correlated with going further in school. We then can then take those correlations and apply them to DNA from a new group of people. And you weight their SNPs by the correlations you estimated in your first study. And then you add up those weighted estimates. So I got two copies of a variant that's associated at R equals 0.003 with going further in school. So two times that correlation. And then you add that up over the whole genome. So what that gives you is a single number, one number per person. That's based entirely from just something we measured from your DNA that reflects our best guess based just on your DNA of your likelihood of showing whatever phenotype we're we're studying. So when we're talking about educational attainment, that polygenic index in white people in the United States, in that population, the polygenic index is as strongly correlated with the rate of going to college as a variable like family income is. So we see that um, students who are on the the lowest 20% of the polygenic index are five times less likely to graduate from college than students who are in the the top 20% of the polygenic index. So it's a really crude number, aggregating across a lot of genetic mechanisms, the vast, vast majority of which are unknown. So it could be that the genes made me have 
a slightly more symmetrical face and teachers like pretty people and they give them better feedback. Or it could be that the genes affected my white matter integrity and I am faster at integrating spatial information. Or it could be that like my genes made me go through puberty later and then boys ignored me in high school. And so that made it easier for me to focus on math. It could have been any of those things. The latter one being the, the true example here. And, and, and so we, we're kind of aggregating across these, all these like really mechanistically unknown things into this kludgy number, but that kludgy number is as predictive as many of our social science variables. So I would say the position that I'm trying to take is that genetics makes a difference for who we are and not just our physical selves or our risk for disease, but also how we succeed in kind of the rules of the economy that is currently set up. Um, things like education, things like income. I think what's more complicated is to talk about, well, well what do we do with that information? One of the things I find fascinating about your book is uh, the evidence that you have about the impact of this, uh, you call polygenic indices. And uh, yeah. for the economists in the room, uh, I put virtual room, is you find that, for example, the polygenic indexes have the same explanatory power as uh, all the social economic factor in determining your success, I think in education or in life, I don't remember exactly. And uh, there is a huge literature in economics about the socioeconomic impact. And, and when I listened to that, I was kind of struck because uh, there's not an equal uh, literature on, on the polygenic indices. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is so interesting that you all have a, a economist as your audience members, right? Because if you're talking to biologists and you say a polygenic score accounts for about, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the variation in rates of college completion, they can kind of be like, well, that's not very much, right? Like 15 percent still leaves 85 percent unaccounted for. But economists and developmental psychologists and sociologists who are used to working with, you know, data on free range humans, like 15% and R squared of 15% is a big effect size, right? It's, it's huge. You know, yeah. Yeah. So there's a new iteration of a large scale genetic study of educational attainment. So linking specific DNA differences between people to their years of formal schooling. It's about to come out in a couple months and that R squared is the exact same R squared as the relationship between years of schooling and wages in the U.S. And I think when you're starting to think about the relationship between genes and education is as strong as the relationship between education and wages, you know, it's really in the field of the types of relationships that we're used to thinking seriously, right? And it's, again, it's not destiny. We don't know for sure how much money someone's going to make based on how far they went in school. Um, but it is telling you something really meaningful about population trends when you're starting to get into R squareds of you know, 10, 15, 20%, definitely. And what do we what do we do about that? What implications does that have for fairness in the world? And I'm I'm thinking about it in a bunch of a bunch of ways because abdicating the conversation about it, which has been the approach taken by most progressives, as you've pointed out, is a vacuum. And in vacuums, all sorts of dangerous things flourish. And yet admitting it and discussing it also carries some danger because that can start to tip into exactly the opposite, right? Exactly what we all fear, which is people typecasting you from the moment, from the moment of birth based on what your genes are. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's really important to think in, in any conversation about, well, what do we do with that information to realize that most Americans currently already think that's true. If you survey Americans, most of them say that genes make a difference. They have an influence, not just on weight and not just on eye color, but on personality and intelligence and academic achievement. And so I think it's really the task of interpreting that result and making sense of it and giving a positive path forward becomes even more vital. So I think of it in kind of a couple of different ways. And so one is, what does it mean for the research we do? How do we identify environmental levers for change? How do we identify, you know, targets for potential interventions? What can we do with this information to make our research better, right? And this is where I think economists are natural leaders, honestly, because you all are really um, used to thinking about, oh, is there some sort of natural experiment in the world that I can exploit to give me new information about what causes what? Um, and so genetics is, is really another, you know, just another example of that kind of tool to make research better. More broadly than that, away from kind of the academic conversation is what do we think of as fair versus unfair inequality? 
And currently in the U.S., there's been such a, an emphasis on this narrative of meritocracy where education has played a really outsized role in our definition of merit. And so I think genetics makes us uncomfortable because it kind of prompts us and I, I'm certainly not the only one and geneticists are not the only one who've been prompting us to have this conversation to think about, is that really how we want to define fair versus unfair? Should so much kind of rest on education when part of education is so heavily influenced by this thing that you have no control over, right? The genetic hand that you happen to be dealt. One other thing I found it particularly striking is that when some of the first results on, on genetics came out about the impact on education, people started to emphasize grits and say that uh, this is actually the solution. And, and, and we all like to think that we succeeded because we are hardworking guys, not because we are genetically blessed. But then you and other colleagues, I, I don't remember, the, find that uh, on executive functions, executive functions are 100% Inevitable. Is that right? Yeah. So there's a couple of things I want to note there, because I think the, the phrase executive functions is used in a, in a lot of different ways. So when we are talking about executive functions, we're talking about really basic cognitive abilities. So for instance, I might flash cards on the screen and ask, does this card match the one that you saw two cards back? Right. And you're kind of having to monitor what you saw and what you're seeing now and, and maintain your attention. So it's this really basic cognitive ability. And what we do find is that in kids who are all schools, right, like they're all going to school in Texas, they're typically developing children. So we're not measuring kids with say, like severe autism spectrum disorders. That if you test them on a bunch of these type of executive function tasks, the variance common to the tasks. So, you know, are you generally good or poor across the different tasks we're administering is nearly 100% heritable. It's as heritable as height. Something like grit or conscientiousness is like, do you like to plan ahead? Are you tend to be an orderly person? Um, how quickly do you give up if the task gets difficult? And what we also see is that those are heritable. So there really isn't an aspect of human individual differences that's going to be your get out of jail free card for grappling with the role of genetics in life. Even things like effort, even things like concentration, all of those things are related to the biology you happen to inherit. Your listeners who are parents know this, right? Like they've seen their kids. They know that some of their kids are more frustration tolerant or more effortful or more orderly or more impulsive than their other kids. We see this in human life. But so if you work hard in school, it's because you're genetically blessed, <laughs> not because uh, you, you make uh, an effort? Yeah. I mean, I think this is where genetics really scrambles with something we really want to do. We want to really neatly divide things up into morally deserving, rewardable effort and circumstances beyond our control. But what happens when some of those circumstances are our biology and they create our brains that are producing the effort? I don't think, once you start thinking about the development of a human life, that distinction we want to draw between things we, things we can be rewarded for because we have control over them and things that we shouldn't be, it just kind of falls apart. It really doesn't make sense developmentally, which people don't like. We, you know, we like to be able to say, you know, this is the the A plus for effort that we get to reward or punish. But pulling that out uh, from the, the mass of things that go into a human life is, is difficult to the point of impossibility, I think. So a different, a different question, knowing all that you could know, how would you restructure the concept of meritocracy in our society? What would you do with it? Oh, that's such a good question. So the first thing that comes to mind is I've been reading recently a book that I wish I had read while I was writing mine. And it's by a law professor, a Joseph Fishkin, and it's called Bottlenecks. He's coming from this perspective of you know, where are there narrow through points in American life, right? So we can think of this as you know, high stakes tests, or we can think of this as the motivation behind ban the box, which was, you know, let's not have everyone who's had an incarceration history be thrown out upon, you know, initially applying for a job, that sort of thing. And then thinking about, well, where, where are the bottlenecks? Where are they the tightest? How could we get them wider? Or how could we get more people around them? And he calls us this kind of pluralistic opportunity structure. And the reason I really love that, part of the reason I really love it, I think it really maps very nicely into 
what is it about the genetics of education that bothers us so much? Like, why is that a harder topic than say the genetics of obesity or the genetics of depression? And I think it's because education at various points plays, plays such a bottleneck role for other things, for employment, for access to healthcare, for certain types of labor conditions. And so I think in thinking about meritocracy, I would like our conversation to be less oriented around who deserves to get through the bottleneck and more around, do the bottlenecks need to be there? How can the bottlenecks be widened? How can we, how can we open up a more pluralistic opportunity structure in America? So, so let me try with something equally difficult. In, in economics, there is this famous result due to Jackie Schleifer that says that if you have uncertainty, you can ensure the moment uncertainty disappears, you cannot ensure anymore. So if in the future we can predict for sure you are expected death, then we cannot ensure against death and we lose some benefits because everybody benefits from having access to a life insurance, especially if you have uh, young kids and so on and so forth. So the fear that I can see in this research is that we're going to be able to determine sooner and sooner who is the winner and the other will not even try because at the moment, if I'm not told that I am genetically not predisposed to do something, I might try. And, and by trying, I accumulate some skills that might be useful later in my life and so on and so on. But if they tell me right away, I was told at age what, 10 that I couldn't sing and I didn't even try. And you no, know, my life has been okay. But if you say, no, you're not predisposed to, to study, for example, that you don't even try, that, that's really a pretty grim life. Yeah. So I have a couple of different responses to that. The first is, I don't think we will ever be at a point in which we can predict really complex human outcomes like education or lifespan or psychiatric disease from DNA alone for lots of reasons, one of which being that all the variation in those things isn't genetic and because different genes are operating in different environments for different people. So I think even as the genetic technology gets better and better, our relationship between, you know, a polygenic index, a measure of someone's DNA and something like whether or not you're going to graduate from college is still going to remain it's not a pregnancy test. It's not a diagnostic test. It's still in social science variable land. If we think about what people are taught about, about genes and biology in high school versus what they need to know in order to be consumers of that information in their lives, I think there's a real disconnect there. So I think there's an educational task. And then finally, I think there's, there's a real regulation task right now in terms of who has access to that genetic information, right? So I personally think that probably a polygenic score is about as predictive of your likelihood of having a car accident as your marital status, right? Your insurance company can certainly use your marital status to set your rates. Can they use your genetics? That's not governed by any federal legislation right now. What about your long-term disability insurance? What about your kid's private school, right? None of those are regulated by legislation right now. And, and I think thinking about where are potential, again, bottlenecks in people's opportunity to participate in modern American life, to what extent could genetic information be used to make those bottlenecks narrower, and then what regulation is necessary to make that less of a possibility to mitigate against that danger? I think that's a really important question. And unfortunately, I think we're, we're not having that conversation right now because too many scientists are mired in the, should we even be doing the science at all? Or do genes really make a difference? Rather than, okay, this is where this is going. What do we need to do? on the ground to, to mitigate against potential harms. Yeah, I think that the issue of regulation is extremely important because we economists, when we see 20, 30 percent explanatory power, we jump up and down and we use that in every economic model. The FICO score that determines whether you can borrow for a mortgage uh, has probably less predictive power than the polygenetic index. And so the risk is that the combination between this information and profit maximizing behavior of people that try to select is that they're going to create labels and uh, you have a low polygenetic index and you are out of every school. And that becomes really kind of a new form of racism. Yeah, I think, I think it does, right? I mean, it's, it's creating, it's discriminatory behavior and it's creating an underclass, right? It's saying that, you know, there's, there's something about you that you can't change that's, that's now part of your ascribed identity 
and it is blocking you off from participating in some form of American life. What's interesting to me is that people, like there's such a paradox, right? Like when we're thinking about healthcare, you know, health insurance is the kind of the one thing that's federally governed right now that you can't discriminate against someone on the basis of genetic information. So like if you have a BRCA gene, you know, they can't refuse you health insurance. If you have actually breast cancer, like before the ACA, before the pre-existing conditions protection, you could. That's very, very strange, right? Like if you have a polygenic index that, that predisposes you towards impulsive behavior, we think that shouldn't maybe be used by your car insurance. But if part of your impulsive behavior is getting divorced, your car insurance already uses that, right? So we, again, I think genetics, what it does is it kind of pushes on some of our little intuitions about what things are fair or unfair to select on, because we have a really strong intuition that we don't want our genes to be used against us. But once you start thinking about all the stuff that is influenced by our genes, that's already used against us, that's already used for selection, a lot of that selection and, and sort of classification of risk that is built into American life starts to feel a little bit morally eerie. And, and I think I don't want people to shrug that off. I want them to sit with it and think about, well, to what extent does that tell us something about the way we approach the, the pooling of risk in this country around you know, the various things that could befall us? And to full information, one of the reasons why we seek out your opinion is because we had two podcasts last year that were very successful about meritocracy and one with Adrian Woldridge, who was, of course, a supporter of meritocracy and sees that this is also almost ethical because it rewards effort. And the other was uh, Sandel that emphasized the lack component. And at the end of the day, a lot has to do with uh, how you interpret the data. And of course, your, your book comes really handy in that dimension. The fact I found it particularly interesting, speaking of intervention, is your example of the glasses and uh, how sort of intervention can be designed to actually reduce inequality rather than uh, exacerbate it. Can, can you elaborate on that? Because I think that that would be very interesting for our uh, listeners. Yeah, the glasses example is a classic and it comes from a 1970s paper by author Goldberger in which he said, you know, look, we know that eyesight is heritable. If you have poor eyesight, particularly in adulthood, that's likely in part because of the genes that you happen to inherit from your parents. We don't then throw up our hands and say, there's nothing we can do about that. What we do is we give a targeted intervention. We give eyeglasses to people who have poor eyesight and not eyeglasses to people who don't. We're using an environmental intervention to counteract a genetically cause inequality and in functioning. So we can think of a lot of examples like this when people are depressed that might be partially genetically influenced, but we might respond to it with therapy. It's harder for some reason for people to keep that in mind when we start talking about genetic influences relevant to education. The thing about meritocracy being good or bad Often I think people fall into the trap of feeling like you need a one size fits all answer to those questions rather than a meritocracy might be instrumentally good for some purposes. And there might be some things, some inequalities between people that no differences in human functioning really justify. And, and that's one thing that I talk about in my book is that these kind of differences, these kind of like equity efficiency trade-offs are kind of the extent to which we um, privilege meritocracy versus um, addressing inequality, we might have different answers depending on whether the outcome we're talking about is graduate admissions to STEM PhD programs versus having access to healthcare. Those are different those are different outcomes for which we might have different decisions. Maybe I was thinking as you were talking that maybe the summary and tell me if you agree with this is that you're arguing for a transparent conversation about how we use these things. And right now we use them, but in very untransparent ways where we pretend that we're not very almost dishonest and hypocritical ways in ways that we pretend we're not, but actually it's embedded throughout every, everything in life. I think that's absolutely true. I, you know, when we discover that the genes you're born with are associated with whether or not you graduate from college. And then we think about what do college graduates get more of compared to non-college graduates in this country right now? 
there, that's telling us something about the world as it is, not necessarily the world as we want it to be, but the world as it is. And, and so I would like us to have a, a transparent conversation about, well, how do we do science to uncover those mechanisms? But also, what does that nudge us to in terms of um, new intuitions about whether it's fair or unfair? The importance of genetics for human development is something that we really want to kind of shirk out of a lot of times and not doing that, kind of staying with it, I do think forces um, a kind of hard but more transparent conversation about values. You do, I think, an excellent job first recognizing terrible use of genetic in the past, especially by social sciences. And and is one one is worse than the other. Economics, uh, sociology, statistics uh, is, is really pretty abysmal. And, and you say very clearly in your book that all the studies are basically about white people. And so you don't touch the difference between races because uh, you can't. However, you punt on another important issue because the studies are done only on white people, but there are white male and female. And I don't know whether there is a different gender in the middle, but I think that uh, you have plenty of that. And so yeah. you punt on the male-female difference uh, and genetic difference. And in part, there is some evidence. So I saw that uh, in executive function, men are genetically inferior to women. <laughs> so this is really interesting. Uh, you know, when we're looking at genetics, you're absolutely right that there's a lot more data on, at least potential data on genetic differences between men and women than there are between uh, racial groups. With education, like when we're looking at educational attainment, part of the reason I don't really, really go into sex differences there is there isn't really that much of a story, right? So if we, if you do the GWAS separately and men versus women, and you look to see like, what's the genetic correlation between them, right? Like what are the genes involved in education in men, the genes involved in education in women, how are they correlated? The correlation is like 0.99. The forthcoming paper on educational attainment has some analysis of X chromosome. There isn't a huge story there. There just isn't much to talk about, talk about there. And what we see is that, you know, when we're just looking at the predictive power of, of a polygenic score, um, I write about this in the book, right? You see really big differences in the early 20th century in the predictive power of the polygenic score for men versus women. It's much more predictive for men than for women. And then as women get access to education, the polygenic score becomes increasingly more predictive of women's educational attainment until you, you essentially get no sex difference um, at the, the latter part of the 20th century. I wanted yeah. to go back to something you'd said earlier about the way in which our DNA will never be completely predictive, that, that we have to worry about aspects of this, of course, but we don't have to worry about the complete diagram being handed to somebody at, at, at birth. To me, that's one of the happiest things I've heard that in 2022. It's been a rough start. That's one, the, <laughs> that's one of the best pieces of news because I, I've always loved that Leonard line from a Leonard Cohen song. It's the crack that lets the light shine yeah. through. You know, It's the things yeah. that we can't quite add up that are going to save us. But as a scientist, as a humanist, which I think you are, as well as a scientist, which, which side of you speaks more loud, more loudly on that? Is the humanist in you happy about that and the scientist sort of annoyed? Or is your overall feeling about that sort of one of relief? I think my overwhelming feeling of that is one of neither relief nor annoyance, but somewhat more just awe. It's really amazing that we walk around and we tell stories about ourselves and we feel agency over our lives and we make moral judgments about ourselves and other people. And we are trapped in these shelves of bodies that are contingent, right? Contingent on the biology and contingent on a developmental program. And I think, you know, mostly I think how lucky am I that I get to think about that mystery all the time. You know, I think it's more a source of awe than anything. One of the things that fascinated me about our conversations on meritocracy was the layers of it. That as you start to unpack what does it mean to be a meritocracy, it gets more and more complex in, in the layers under the surface. And I think our conversation with Paige Harden was really interesting because it showed more of the layers underneath that surface, right? That even some of the components that we all think of as belonging to us somehow or as being our right, like our ability to work hard, are actually determined by our as well. Absolutely, Benedict. I think that this is the fascinating part about meritocracy. And also what I understood reading uh, Catherine's book and talking to her is uh, to what extent what we define merit 
is really a function of the way we design a test and to whom we design a test. We all have a different portfolio of skills. If you design a test based on singing, I'm the last one in the class. And actually, as a little kid in elementary school, uh, the priest told me to stay away from the microphone because I will ruin the Christmas songs. <laughs> I have to interrupt you right here because this is something we have in common for all of our journalist e economist differences. So I grew up in a really small town in northern Minnesota called Hibbing, and I, I actually went to elementary school in an even smaller town called Pengilly, and there were not enough kids to make choir. And I thought I could sing, and I tried out for choir, and I still remember the uh, the teacher hitting a note and having, ah, ah, and she finally said, we don't have enough kids for choir, but you can't join. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, anyway, back to what you were saying. A commonality, Luigi. Yeah, and uh, I cannot fish for my life. In a sense, even when I go to the fishing ponds where you have to pay for what you catch, I fail to catch fish even there. So I'm really incompetent in, in so many dimensions. And even uh, Arden said that one of the few things that seems to have a difference between men and women is your ability to organize spatially and actually go, go back home to have a sense of orientation. And I have a terrible sense of orientation. So. Well, I have a terrible sense of orientation too, actually. So there's another commonality. Go figure. <laughs> but, but, so, um, but so I think that, uh, uh, and, and some of these tests have some connection with what we need in society at some moment. So, you know, in the old tribal world in which you had to survive to become a, an adult, you had a, like a, a, a trial uh, by fire was because that's the kind of life you were supposed to run later, and, it, and that was a good test of your ability to survive. Today, many uh, sorting is done on things that has nothing to do with what you do later on in life, and is more like a way to determine a easy way to rank people, not necessarily for efficiency considerations. Yeah, I think I think that's really interesting. I would almost phrase it somewhat differently, that it's really interesting. We, we tend too much to take the system of rules that dictate the outcomes for granted. We think this is just the way it is without actually fundament, pausing and fundamentally looking at those rules and saying, well, wait, where, where did those come from and, and what are they based on? And I think it's always really interesting when you deconstruct that, that, that system. So in the case of meritocracy, you say, well, what are the rules that determine the outcome of meritocracy, not just this is what the rules are, are determining, and therefore it is what it is. And I, I think I think of that, and that, that applies to so many other spheres, too. It actually, there's an interesting analogy to some of our discussions about capitalism and markets, that capitalism and markets work according to the rules we've laid down, too. There's no such thing as a purely free market. It's actually determined by the rules we've put in place. And so these underlying structures are starting to seem more and more interesting to me. Yeah, and I think that overlaying a moral dimension, as Sandal was saying, is very dangerous. Sandal himself was recognized that somebody like Hayek was mad enough not to do that and say, look, the reason why uh, you need to compensate more brain surgeon is not because that job is more meritorious. It's simply because you need to attract talents, and especially if uh, the life you conduct is really painful, you need to retain talents because we care to have good brain surgeons. When everybody, even Michael Sandel, when they have brain surgeon, they want a good surgeon. <laughs> Right. But, it, but it is actually interesting. This is taking the conversation on a small tangent. But even in the case of doctors, you can argue the point you made earlier, which is that our system for selecting who can be, become a doctor doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean we get the best doctors. Because I think many doctors in spheres and, and aspects of medicine other than brain surgery would, would tell you that bedside manner and being able to communicate to a patient and being able to talk to them and being able to understand where that person is, is coming from is every bit as important as your ability to master the knowledge of, of medicine. Yet we select for people who can do the latter rather than people who have any empathy and ability to do to do the former. So it's, it's, it's to me, in different areas of medicine, it's an interesting example of how what we select for may not actually even in the end be what we want. And also what we select is what is easy to select on because even if you decide that uh, medicine, bad sign manners are important, and I am 100% with you that they're very important, it's much harder to select on your bad sign manners than it is on uh, how much you solve uh, differential equations. Differential equation, there is a right and wrong answer, and I can rank people on the basis of how many mistakes they make very easily. It's also proof to liability suit or discrimination suit. I cannot say that the, the judge was biased because uh, he like, didn't like you or whatever. So I think that uh, in a litigious society like the United States, 
I think the objectivity is gaining a premium even when it's not the right dimension. I, I think that's a really good point. And we're green too much, Luigi. Not only do we have our lack of ability to orient spatially and our lack of ability to sing in common, but it turns out we agree on many of these things as well. We'll find something to disagree about later. I, I agree. I think it's not just the, the litigation. I think it's that an increasingly complex world, we're all looking for shortcuts. Little things that we can say, this person fits in, this person is who I want in my group, or, they, or, they, or, they, or they're not. And so one of the ways we shortcut is academic achievement. And that's dangerous dangerous in all kind of, kinds of ways, because not only are those supposedly quantitative measures themselves perhaps not as quantitative as, as they appear, but it allows all sorts of unconscious biases to be, to, be, to be put to work. But I think that is one of the tensions in modern life is our desire and very real need to come up with shortcuts versus the really important notion that we need to think about things more deeply and deconstruct them more. And those two things really are in tension with each other. But w what I learn from reading the book and talking to Catherine is that really we're missing out greatly not talking about genetics. Of course, genetic has a terrible history and we need to be careful. But, you know, as my father was saying, the fact that most uh, geniuses are misunderstood doesn't mean if you are misunderstood, you are a genius. And so uh, the fact that a lot of racist people do genetic doesn't mean the genetic is intrinsically racist. Catherine does a fantastic job in explaining how you can do a more compassionate form of genetic and why it is necessary, both from a compassionate point of view and from an efficiency point of view, because we're wasting a lot of money trying to do intervention that have no chance of success. I was struck by a quote, and I'm embarrassed in my copious note-taking, and I don't know if it came from the New Yorker article about her, another podcast she was on, or about her from her book, that it's a really telling quote, and it's building a commitment to egalitarianism on our genetic uniformity is building a house on sand. And I think that sums up very nicely what, what you were getting at. What I really liked in her book and in our conversation with her was this idea that we're conflating things that don't necessarily have to be conflated. And I think that's actually been a theme through some of our capitalism episodes. But in this case, what we're conflating is we're conflating the idea of meritocracy with the idea of a structure that the structure of society that you want to have. So we're saying, okay, we have a meritocracy and we're letting merit determine everything, including these increasingly unequal outcomes between people. Well, in addition to breaking down what meritocracy is, you can also say, well, we do want a more fair system of meritocracy to determine certain things, like whether, like whether or not you can become a brain surgeon a brain surgeon, whether or not you're equipped to become a brain surgeon. But we don't want merit, even a good notion of meritocracy to determine whether or not you get health insurance and so, or, or how, how you can live your life, whether you, whether you can afford to own a house or not. And so I think, I think there's, there's an interesting way in which, for the sake of simplification, we conflate these things that, don't, that, that shouldn't necessarily be conflated. Just because you say you want a meritocracy doesn't mean you have to let the meritocracy determine everything about the structure of the society in which we live. No, I agree, but I I very much prefer the term that uh, uh, we were using in in the podcast last year, which is talentocracy rather than meritocracy, because it takes away this moral dimension to it that I think is is very poisonous because uh, gives you a sense of moral superiority. Yes, I agree, and I've always had this uh, thing that I thought was just an annoyance on my part that was one of my idiosyncratic annoyances, but I've begun to think that there might be an underlying serious note to it. And what I mean is the way the use of the word talent has expanded in the last couple of decades. We used to think of somebody as talented if they were a musician, they were an artist. And you've noticed that, at least I've noticed that increasingly over the last couple of decades in the business world, people say he's talented. Usually he's talented rather than she's talented, but they, they use the word talent to describe somebody's ability to have business insights. And I wonder if that's, I, I've always thought that this is just a, a, a idiosyncratic annoyance of mine that I think the word talent should be used to describe, describe your ability to sing, which we don't have, or your ability to do art, but not necessarily your how, how, how smart you are. And now I wonder as we talk, has that been deliberate? And, 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 and not deliberate in the sense that somebody thought, sat back and thought about it, but deliberate in the way these, these things happen, that increasingly defining business people as talented um, has, has become part of a way of saying they, they, that they deserve these higher rewards, that these people, that, that it, it's been a, a, another way to justify the meritocracy. Does that make sense? I understand where you're coming from, but I actually take it uh, differently. And I will interpret it in a slightly different way that in the old days, competition was less intense. And if you were a businessman, it's maybe because 
you were born in the right family or you had a little bit of education. But today, there are so many people with, who are with good education that to be a good businessman, you need to have the extra talent. It's not just the education. You need the extra talent. A bit like the artist. And in a sense, I, I can try as much as you want to try to draw and I'm certainly I'm beca will become better than I am also because I'm terrible, but I will never be talented at drawing. And, and so the people who stand out in this dimension, whether it's art or business or whatever other profession, they are really talented. I hear you, but the use of the word talent as applied to a field like business is going to, is going to continue to bug me. Can ESG investing create meaningful social change? Join Chicago Booth's Rustandi Center for Social Sector Innovation and the Stigler Center for the Study of the Economy and the State for a virtual session that investigates how ESG could truly be a force for social and environmental impact. It's January 24th. Register at chicagobooth.edu slash unpacking ESG. But actually, let's disagree a bit because I'm sure we disagree on, on the gender part because uh, the only part I was a bit disappointed by, Catherine, is that she really shy away from my question on gender. I understand why, because she's so attacked on every front, but her defense in the book that we don't have genes for our races is correct, but it doesn't apply to men and women. And, and I think that it's inevitable that we're going to find some correlation, maybe big, some small, I don't know, in which uh, the talent is different. And so we need to start preparing for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose maybe that is, maybe if she wants her message to be heard, that is one bridge too far, one set of enemies that she doesn't, that she doesn't need to make. But I am in agreement with you that I can't believe there won't be differences. There have to be. And some will be in women's favor and some will be in, in, in men's favor. And I don't think that that has to be a terrible thing. We appreciate on some level that we don't all want to be exactly alike. If we were all exactly the same, the world would be really, really, really boring. As long as differences aren't punitive, I think hopefully we can have some appreciation of that. And it doesn't have to be a bad thing to know that there are differences. But you know, it's, it's fascinating. It's always been kind of a topic of debate among feminists. How much do you say? And I remember I did a piece um, for Fortune many, many, many years ago about about why there were no women in the hedge fund business. And it, it really encapsulated this debate in that about half of the women I spoke to who said, well, women are no different than men. We invest exactly the same way. We have exactly the same capabilities because I don't want to go to a place where I say that women and men are different because that opens up this whole Pandora's box of saying that we're different and that will be turned against women. And then there was another set of women who really embraced this notion of we're different, we're better, take, we take risk better, we're more thoughtful about things, we, we see the world differently. And so it's really a division even among women themselves, women ourselves, whether you fall into the category of I don't want to acknowledge any difference because they're, they're lie dragons, or I want, to, I want to acknowledge difference and claim that we're better. And it's, it's, it'll, it'll be really interesting to see how any evolving evidence on this front affects that, that split. And I think that this is where maybe the abuse of meritocracy creates some problems because the moment you say different, if you have everything value ranked with merit, you immediately say they are different, they're better, uh, or they are worse. And this is, it's very hard to just stick to the point they're different. Look, having some uh, better spatial ability is super, super important if you are in the savannah chasing uh, gazelle. But with Google Map, it's not a big deal. Okay, Am I better or worse because I don't have a huge sense of orientation? Certainly, you don't want to put me as a, as a guide for an Everest uh, hike. But uh, in, in, for 99.9% .9 of the jobs today, that's completely irrelevant. We need to more understand what our strengths and weaknesses on some dimension rather than attribute a, a better, worse ranking. I actually disagree with you, which is that how relevant is that point of difference is actually in and of itself debatable. And so I think that's very true with spatial ability, because I would argue it applies to a lot more than your ability to uh, determine where you are in the world without access to Google Maps. I think spatial ability is the essence of being able to do math at a high level, is being able to grasp where things are in space and how they move in space. It's for sure key to being a good pool player, being able to understand just intuitively what's going to happen if you hit the ball with a certain kind 
kind of spin what's going to happen to the cue ball and what's going to happen to the object ball without having to diagram it out. But the broader macro point is that 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 would be true of so many things that we say, well, this is just a little thing. It's okay to be different on it. But but is it just a little thing? Take hindsight. There is no doubt that having 2020 is better than uh, being sort of nearsighted. As Catherine told us, there is a very easy way to fix it and to compensate. Now, do you want to put somebody that is very nearsighted as a pilot of a, a fighter, fighter jet? Probably not. So there is an advantage of, of being 2020. I don't think that in society we consider inferior people who are nearsighted. Inferior superior carries a huge, huge weight. It, it does, but it's often personal. And so your example of eyesight is for me. I went through a phase, I think it might have been at my mother's urging, where I wanted to go to West Point and be a fighter pilot. And I have um, astigmatism and a wandering eye, neither of which are fixable by, by any means. And I would be disqualified based on my eyesight. So even, <laughs> that's a little bit of a personal story, but even these things that are even these things that are not necessarily better or worse or dispositive in life are, are personal often. And so I think they're all going to be very touchy in ways that we can't really anticipate. First of all, I got a huge insight on your personality. Now I understand why you have such a fighting personality. You want to be a fighter pilot of all things. This aside, I'm not saying that, look, it, this is not a, an advantage or disadvantage, but I think society does not label you as inferior if you see less well. Some things is better for others is, is, is worse. And it's uh, I learned playing soccer. Now I understand why I was so terrible because I, I don't have good spatial ability. So that, that you explained to me that. But there are, there are two types of player. There are the one that plays offense and then they have to, you shoot 20 times in a game. And if you do a score once, you are a hero, right? And so you have to forgive yourself 19 mistakes. If you are a goalie, you have 20 shots, you have to catch them all, right? If you make one mistake out of 20, is a huge mistake. So the kind of personality that you must have as a goalie and as a forward are completely different. Now, is one a superior personality than the other? No, it's different. So if we are to have any chance of creating a utopia for humankind, I would argue part of it should be exactly this discussion we're, we're having as, a, as an acceptance of differences rather than a labeling of them as inferior or, or, or superior and a really broad conversation about that so that differences really do become, this is going to sound cheesy, so, so the differences really do become beautiful instead of bad. But I think there are so many structures in the world that stand in, in, in the way of that kind of utopia from the way Academ academia works at, at a young age where your ability to get into an Ivy League school is determinative of, of, of the rest of your life in some ways. And from our very human desire to be, be better than other people, to label ourselves as superior to other people, I think that that's a core, a core and ugly part of humanity. And so I, while I while I really do think that this broad acceptance of, of, of difference would be <laughs> would, would get us close to closer to, to a utopia, I just don't know how it will ever work, practically speaking. You know, utopia by definition is something you can never achieve. But I think that at least we could move in that direction. And, and I uh, personally, I can say that these three episodes together made me change my views. And uh, I was much more in favor of meritocracy to begin with. And now I, I clearly see the downside of pushing too hard on this front. Yeah, interesting. I remember years ago saying to my father in the wake of the uh, in the wake of me getting credit for the Enron story, I remember saying, well, this is really upsetting to me because I don't, I don't think I deserve it. And he said to me, well, what makes you think you deserve anything? And people, I, I remember saying that to a therapist I had at the time who was like, oh, this is why you have issues with your parents and this is so horrifying. But I actually think now that what my father said was really, really wise. Uh, um, and I think that was the spirit in which he meant it, that really, what makes you think that you, that you deserve anything? That even your, that, that, and that degree of humility is really essential if we're all going to exist together in any kind of um, in any kind of pleasant way. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I are having on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should also check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories. It's not told through opinions and anecdotes, but rather through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. So if you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago podcast network.
So today we thought we would do as our capital is or capital isn't Microsoft's controversial acquisition of Activision. Wow, it's hard would be hard to say that really quickly. Microsoft's going to be acquiring Activision Blizzard uh, for $95 a share, this says, in an all-cash transaction that's valued at $68.7 billion. Controversial acquisition of Activision. Huh, maybe it's not that hard. I think this is about Microsoft getting really premier first-party uh, co uh, content to go with their big suite of Xbox. Uh, you know, Xbox is more than 100 million people. Luigi, your thoughts? So my preamble is I belong to a generation that doesn't do video games. So this is not exactly my cup of tea in terms of market. This said, I think is is fascinating because to me is the reaction to the fact that Google and Facebook are entering into this space. This space used to be dominated by Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft because the, the console was crucial. And now in the near future, the console beca will become less important because Google now has some way in which you can do video games, streaming without any console. And so there's a fear that there will be much more entry in the industry. So people are trying to consolidate to defend themselves. That's interesting. I am not a video gamer either. I've been told actually I should be that it might improve my driving skills. And Luigi, maybe it could even improve your sense of direction. Video gaming is supposed to work wonders for all, all sorts of things. Anyway, that 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 aside, I admit I'm a little biased in this. I had written a, a a story about Microsoft back in, I think it was 2013, 2014. And basically the guns were blazing for Microsoft from Silicon Valley. Everyone in Silicon Valley, or at least a lot of people were eager to say that Microsoft was on the brink of failure. They were so far behind and had screwed up so badly that they could, they could no longer fix it. And that frankly was the story if I had a story in my mind that I thought I was going to write when I set out. And I ended up meeting Sacha Nadella and thinking, if anybody can save Microsoft, it's this guy. And in my um, innately contrarian way of being, I couldn't help kind of starting to root for Microsoft after that. And, and, and so I think the big bad Microsoft of all companies, which was, you know, the ultimate evil empire when, when I was growing up in journalism. Um, but but I, I, th I think that there's a certain amount of scrutiny that Microsoft's acquisition of Activision, there I said it again, gets that the big tech giants acquisition of competitors doesn't get. And I recognize that that's in part due to the gaming culture and gamers see themselves as outsiders and, and they don't want to be corrupted by big corporate ownership. But I still think that the amount of rage directed toward Microsoft is a little bit out of step with the amount of rage that comes at other big, powerful tech companies that make probably more meaningful acquisitions in the scheme of the world. I agree with you because, uh, again, not being a video gamers, I'm much more concerned about information, news, media, and the impact of this on democracy than the impact of video games on democracy. And the most important aspect that I think that is not being emphasized, at least in the articles I read, is that the game is changing. Uh, the video game game is changing because... Uh, uh, they, there will be a lot of entry by the same players, but players that so far uh, uh, have not been in the video game business. And I think that this is a, a defensive acquisition, not a, a outreach of Microsoft in a different domain. I, I, I agree. And I think that's a smart way of thinking about it. That said, if you look at the history of many big acquisitions, and I am saying this as an anecdote driven journalist, not uh, empirically speaking, I have not done the analysis. But if you look at the many, many big acquisitions, they don't they don't turn out well. Look at Microsoft has effectively destroyed Skype, or at least not done with it what one could have done with Skype. And so the history of Microsoft making big acquisitions and making making them phenomenally successful isn't great. And I think that's actually true of a lot of big companies. So my guess is that this doesn't bode well for Activision's innovation and ability to succeed in the future unless, and I don't know the answer to this, unless its culture is very similar already to that of Microsoft. And for some reason, I really, really doubt that Activision, Activision's existing culture is similar to Microsoft. If I had to bet from the standpoint of sheer, is this going to make Activision more valuable or less valuable? I'm going to say it's going to make Activision a lot less valuable. And that from this, in a purely ca destruction of capital way, this is a capital isn't. Historically, you're absolutely right. The big exception, of course, are the ones where you do generate some monopoly power. So Facebook acquisition of Instagram or WhatsApp uh, have worked out really, really well. But in a sense, the fact we're worried about Microsoft and uh, the success of this acquisition suggests that maybe the antitrust con uh, concerns are less than uh, people make them to be and the business concerns are bigger.
Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.